You know, it's rather strange to think that one of the rarest CPUs is probably also one of the most common. This is Intel's upgrade chip for the Socket 4 Pentiums. Is it a hidden gem? Was it useful? Or was it too little too late? Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and as we just heard, we're going to have a look at the Intel Pentium Overdrive for Socket 4 systems today. It is essentially a P54 core, but you don't run into these very often. I don't know exactly how uncommon they are, but yeah, they, they just don't really show up, so I'm guessing not very common, basically. So we'll see if there's anything special about it, we'll see how it performs, things like that. I don't really have much else to say uh, on camera at the start of this. Well then, yeah, late as always, so let's get on with it before that gets any worse. Let's get one thing out of the way for those who haven't been around here for a while. Socket 4 chips are big, and this overdrive is no exception. From a technical aspect, there's really not too much going on, at least not as far as I'm aware. Unlike the Socket 3 version for 486 systems, because where well, that had to be heavily modified to run on half the bus width and received additional cash to try and compensate the slower boards, which I think it probably did a little too well for its own good, the Socket 4 overdrive is pretty much just a regular P54 that fits into Socket 4 boards. Really nothing was done to the CPU core, it has no extra cash, the, the bus width is the same, it speaks the same language, there's likely some circuitry to translate the logic voltages back and forth, but that's really it. As far as I'm aware, there's very little difference between the two platforms at all. Socket 4 and 5, just basically the same thing, but at different voltages, and of course with different physical characteristics. Obviously, it's a clock doubling CPU. At 133 MHz, it will be running on 66 MHz bus. Interestingly, Intel marketed this as also being a 120 MHz upgrade chip for 60 MHz systems. And given every motherboard I've encountered or heard of has a jumper that can set 66 MHz, I'm somewhat baffled as to why anybody would run one at the lower speed. Compatibility, maybe, but I don't really think that was an issue by then. Not at these speeds. Well, outside of Cygnosis games that don't have timers. So that's that, end of video, right? We already know pretty much everything about this. Well, no, because the word is that these aren't as fast as the real Pentium 133 chips, or at least they don't perform as quickly due to motherboards or other factors, and it'd make sense, it's an older platform, and Intel might have crippled them on purpose as well, I mean, it, of course they wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, we're going to do what we always do, and test this out. We're going to rip out my K5 and install a 133 MHz Pentium in there, made in the land of P9, and also replace my 66 MHz Pentium with this overdrive chip. If you didn't know, the Socket 4 Pentiums have no multiplier, they just run at the FSB speed. Both systems will be stripped down to a fairly minimal configuration, will have no TSRs loaded, both systems are going to be running this Matrox Mystique G220 card, you could argue that this card is a little late for these machines or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's a good card for testing such things because it's really fast, which should eliminate the possibility of outrunning the video card and, well, at the same time, let us see any bottlenecks in the motherboard's design. In fact, I'm pretty certain this card can go a little further than either of these systems is going to push it here. Both of these motherboards use the SIS500 chipsets, they're both using parity memory, and both are being crippled slightly by a SCSI controller because I'm too lazy to change the hard drives for IDE right now. Maybe we'll talk about this small hit in performance someday, but it's really not that interesting. It just seems SCSI hard drives aren't very good at loading smaller files. If you're doing long sequential reads and writes, they're brilliant, but if you're loading lots and lots of little texture files into a game, you're probably actually going to lose performance, and it seems to just hammer the interrupts and stall the machine. It's not really very good. Something to keep in mind if you're messing with these machines, that expensive upgrade to SCSI maybe isn't worth it. Especially if you're only going to be playing games on the thing. 
The Pentium 66 will also be displayed in the charts, just to show how much of a boost the 133 MHz server drive offers. I mean, it is an upgrade chip, so we should probably see how much of an upgrade it really is. Ready? Well, let's go. 3D Bench is close as hell, but the P133 edges it. The overdrive is in second, and predictably the P66 is in last place. And this falls in line with what we've been led to believe on the internet and in magazines of the past. But the results of the two 133 MHz chips are really close. Too close to really call it, in all honesty. Otherwise, the overdrive is offering around a 39% boost over the 66 MHz P5 chip. There were significant redesigns to the Pentium chips between the original P5 and these later, faster P54 chips. I do wonder how much of that was just reducing power consumption to prevent it setting fire and how much of it was oriented towards performance. I do think it's worth our time to note some of the finer details. This is the 66 MHz Pentium. This is the 133 MHz overdrive. Look at the die shrink. Like, it's not a massive shrink, but it's definitely significant, especially considering the are more transistors in this one than there are in this one. PC player sees the overdrive jump ahead, but by less than one whole point, 31.3 versus 31.1. It's within the margins for error, and to all intents and purposes, the two 133 MHz chips perform identically here. In all honesty, I suspect if we kept rerunning the tests, they'd probably start trading places, depending on what the weather was like on any given occasion. It's also a 53% boost over the 66 MHz CPU. I'm, I'm not even joking so much with that, the temperature will affect things like the clock generator ever so slightly, and it might tweak the score. Top bench is really close. The P133 wins, but with 268 versus 264, it's practically no difference. 25% faster than the P66 on 211 points. Which is still doing really well here, actually, but I guess 16-bit performance was going to start falling off as, well, people were going to be moving to Windows 95 and 32-bit applications over the coming years. It makes more sense to start focusing your CPU designs towards that. I think we were all already aware that performance does not tend to scale linearly with clock speeds, and, well, this is proof. SpeedSys shows the overdrive as being faster, by a fraction, as in, there's basically no difference. Again, this could well be within the margins for error. It also shows the overdrive as offering a 99% boost over the P66, the only test which does. It's almost like it just uses the clock speed. I know it doesn't just use the clock speed to determine this, but... Yeah, it's kind of interesting that it comes out with that. Memory bandwidth is a few megs faster on the P133 motherboard, but by very little. Incidentally, that one is running EDO, so... Well, I guess it's proof that the early implementations of this didn't make any particularly large difference, and I can confirm that it's less than a 10 megabyte per second improvement. Similarly, the frame buffer can be accessed a little faster on the P133 board, but still by only a few megs per second, and whilst this does suggest the Socket 5 motherboard is faster, at least in its PCI implementation, it also isn't particularly relevant in most cases when you consider the fact that we could hit the frame rate cap in Doom at less than half of this speed, and the Windows GUI, as was becoming increasingly popular at the time, actually makes pretty efficient use of the frame buffer due to rarely ever redrawing the entire screen. I suppose that was inherited from when systems were slower and everything was on ISA. I mean, if you can squeeze those sort of things down an 8 meg ISA bus, I don't think we're going to be worrying like 40, 50 some megs per second on PCI. We're just not going to have a problem. Now, the level 1 cache is faster on the overdrive, but by less than 1%, and the P66 lags behind as expected. Level 1 cache is pretty much identical, a half faster on the overdrive, but has to be within the margins for error again, and these will trade places if we keep rerunning the tests. Even the P66 isn't too shabby here. Memory throughput is much faster on the Socket 5 motherboard, about 20 megs or so quicker. About a 49% boost over the Socket 4 board, but we can actually reach this if we play with timings. In fact, both of them will top out stability-wise around the same speeds in this regard. It's just that every timing was left on automatic here, so as to represent a, a typical system of the time. 
the average end user wasn't going to play with these things and I'm really quite certain those settings were almost always left on automatic unless the owner of the machine really knew what they were doing and were prone to playing with such things like you or I probably are. There's also an argument to be made for the fact that Pentiums were really expensive when they were new and so things like this would have been workstation hardware in a lot of cases and I'm pretty certain nobody would have played with the settings there solely because, well, things like SCSI controllers and video hardware just don't like things not conforming to the norm. It, it tends to upset them, and so I can't really see people having played with those very much. Doom is pretty much the same speed on both the 133 MHz chips. Naturally, it's like, what, a, a third quicker than the P66? Still, there are less than three ticks between the 133 MHz chips. I'm starting to think this whole overdrive chips weren't as fast as Socket 5 chips is another case of hearsay and likely improper testing performed in the distant past. And why does this keep happening? Otherwise, it does make sense. I mean, we established it's pretty much the same CPU core as the Socket 5 chip in the Socket 4 overdrive. It really should perform the same, and any differences you'd think would have to be down to the motherboard or the missing pins. Socket 4 has 47 less pins than Socket 5. I wonder what those additional pins are actually doing, I'm kind of curious. Quirk is actually faster on the overdrive by 2.5 frames per second, 27.5 versus 25.0, which it's not hugely significant, but it's quite a gap, all things considered. The P66 holds its own at 19.1, meaning the overdrive is 44% faster than the chip it replaces. Really not too shabby, in all honesty. So as far as the 133 MHz chips go, we can pretty much call it a draw, there is no definitive winner. However, we should consider a couple of things. The old Intel Mercury chipset is considerably slower than the Sys chipset that I'm using today. And let me tell you, those Intel made Mercury boards are really fucking bad. Uh, Gateway used these, avoid those. I can't speak for the ones used in compact systems because my Desk Pro 560 doesn't work, which isn't a good omen. I guess maybe they're not that good or I'm just not very lucky. Uh, my sample size isn't large enough to call it on those. But back on point, the Sys chipset we're using here is faster than the Intel Mercury, and as the Socket 4 overdrive launched in 1996, the Intel Triton chipset would already have been out, which is slightly faster than the Sys chipset we're using today, which we actually saw in the previous video. The differences should still be relatively small, however. Hey, I know, just for fun, let's upset the tables a little bit. The K5 is faster at 3D Bench, the K5 is faster at PC Player, the K5 is faster at Top Bench, the K5 is faster in Speed Sys as CPU test, the K5 has better memory bandwidth, the K5 has faster frame buffer access, the overdrive is still faster in regards to cache, the K5 is about equal on memory throughput, which figures, the K5 is faster in Doom, the K5 is barely faster than the P66 in Quake, which isn't fantastic, but I don't really play that game. Moral of the story, maybe get a K5, they look pretty fucking good to me, at least at this speed. Now the socket free overdrive has a really neat feature where you could put tape over the fan tachometer pin and force the CPU to run without a clock multiplier. I'd like to do that here with the socket 4 version, see how it performs clock for clock against the original P5 chip. I mean it does have the updated P54 core, and it does have extra transistors in there, another 200,000 of them which is Quite a lot. So you think that's got to do something, but curiously this feature isn't present and I found nowhere to trigger anything similar. Not on this chip. It's not like Socket 4 boards have multiplier jumpers to play with. Socket 4 CPUs don't have clock multipliers. But on the other hand, Socket 5 boards do. And sometimes changing clocks and multipliers with the system actually running on very specific motherboards and CPUs will force the CPU into single clock modes. Now you may argue I could try changing the clock jumpers on a socket 4 board while it's running, but this also changes the voltage, meaning the CPU loses power for a moment, and as no reset signal is generated once the power comes back on, the system enters an undefined state, which in this instance basically means it's going to crash. Nonetheless, as we established, 
it may be possible to do this on a socket 5 board, and we know the performance is really pretty much the same between that overdrive and the regular P54. Seems like a good test candidate, and I cannot recommend doing this kind of thing, and I don't know why it works, because it probably shouldn't. It may be an anti-overclocking measure. But we do have a P54 running at 66 MHz. So are those additional transistors just power management, or do they affect the performance in any way? We are going to be using a Triton motherboard for this, because it's the only one I can get to do this. The performance should be close enough to the SIS board that, well, we'll be able to have a look and see what's going on performance-wise. And after a lot of playing around with things, wasting over an hour on this, some very peculiar results showing up along the way, desired speed is achieved, and this is how it stacks up. The P66 is faster in 3D Bench, the P66 is faster in PC Player, the P66 is faster in Top Bench, the P54 is faster in SpeedSys CPU test, this as near as makes no difference. The P66 has better memory bandwidth. The P66 has slightly faster access to the frame buffer. The P66 is slightly faster in level 1 cache, though it's as near as makes no difference. The P66 is slightly faster in accessing its level 2 cache, though it's close at around only a 1 meg difference. The P66 has slightly better memory throughput, but only by a couple of megs. The P66 is faster in Doom, and the P66 is also over 4 frames per second faster in Quake. It's very interesting, it, it does seem that clock for clock the P54 may be a little bit slower than the original P5. I don't really consider this to be an issue though, because they never sold a P54 that was single clocked, or if they did it's some obscure model I'm not aware of. It's not really an issue then because it was always clock doubled or at least had a multiplier of some sort, 1.5 being the lowest, like the Pentium 75 and Pentium 90, and one of the Pentium 100s. I think there's like a, a 50 times 2 and a 66 times 1.5 for that. I can't remember, I would have to check. Uh, it makes me wonder which one I have and if I've been running it at the wrong speed all these years. Uh, you know, it. It's uh, not, not an issue uh, because, like I said, they seem to take off very quickly when the, the clock multiplier is in use. And as they always used it, it makes sense the design would be optimised to work that way. Of course, we don't know if uh, an original P5 would do that because they don't have clock multipliers at all. And I'm very much certain they didn't make one of those that did. The boards don't have jumpers for them or anything, and you know it was just never a feature. If it was going to get that feature, I guess they would have been multiplier locked like this overdrive is. Now, the thing with the overdrive as well, obviously not being common means it didn't sell very well. Which figures because Socket 4 wasn't common, it was very expensive when it came out. It wasn't around very long before Socket 5 came out. These tests do make you wonder what the extra 47 pins are for in Socket 5. But still, not being common, not selling well. Does that mean it's no good? Was it overpriced? And I can't really find prices for the thing in old magazines or anything. Uh, Catalogues just, it doesn't really seem to get that much of a mention just other than, oh, it's coming. Uh, so I don't know how much it cost, which means I, I'm basically left to guess. Uh, given the, the one for 486 systems, I don't think was prohibitively expensive versus the competition. Uh, in this case, Let's assume that it's a few hundred dollars, uh, maybe somewhere between three hundred and five hundred dollars, and uh, I don't really know, but it seems like it would be somewhere around there. Maybe you could get a new CPU and a motherboard for that. But here's the thing, I actually think unless this was really, really expensive compared to the regular one, like say it did cost as much as a Socket 5 motherboard and CPU, if you had a Socket 4 system back then, I think this would have been a really good upgrade. If you'd wanted to upgrade, I think this probably would have been a good idea. And the reason for that is, like, usually I'd say no, but Socket 4's a dead-end platform here. You can't upgrade it any further than this, at least not officially. We'll get to that in a moment. The thing is, Socket 7 didn't arrive until 1997, and this server drive came out in 1996. So if you're upgrading right then, well... A lot of boards said they had Socket 7 in 1996, a lot of boards said they had Socket 7 in 1995. 
The thing is, they don't. They might have the extra hole for it. They might even have had pads for the additional voltage regulators, but a lot of them don't have the additional voltage regulators. A lot of them don't even have the the little pin header for putting the voltage regulation module in. And I don't think that was ever properly standardized because it seems to be wired different on different motherboards. So yeah, really you're at a dead end on socket five. You, you might be able to go up to a 200 megahertz Pentium, but that wasn't out yet. So yeah, really you're just gonna dead end at the same point or end up having to pay a lot of money for something down the line anyway. Therefore, I think this thing probably was a viable upgrade unless it was like twice the cost or something, which I don't think it would have been. Uh, performance, evidently, people have probably bullshitted again, but on the other hand, they might have tested Intel Mercury boards, which are absolutely abysmal. It still should be in the ballpark, though, I think. It shouldn't be that much slower, even in one of those, than a run-of-the-mill Socket 5. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty decent, I've got to be honest. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to put it back on a piece of foam. Basically, it's just turning my interesting Socket 4 machine into a boring Socket 5 equivalent. But... It was nice to test out. I've always wanted to see how these perform. I've always been curious about that. And now we have an answer. Now, there I do have this device, which is an Opti Sailor Boy. I don't know if another one of these has been around. And sometimes it works, but I couldn't get it working for this video. I wanted to test it out to see if there was any different. It seems we don't have to, because it seems there is no real difference other than the the voltage regulation being on board the, the overdrive. This is kind of like the overdrive, but everything's off the CPU. Like, the, the logic level translators and the voltage regulator are on the PCB instead. It's really unreliable. It seems to break constantly. I've had to fix this thing so many times. Now the board interconnects are coming loose on it, so... Yeah, very badly made. I can see why I've never seen another one of these. It's pretty terrible. It's interesting when it does work. I'd be curious to know if you could stick an MMX overdrive in here. If I ever get that to work, I guess we'll see it again, but it's very low on the priorities list. I don't have much else to say on this thing. We've tested it out. We know what it does. It, I'd say it was predictable, and really it should have been, but as I said, the, the official record shows, like, it's not as fast, and turns out it is, at least when you put it on the same chipset. So, yeah, I, I'm really curious as to what those extra pins do on Socket 5, because it seems they don't do anything. <laughs> uh, they're probably all just ground pins or something. I, I always thought that about Socket 939. I, I know it's not actually the case with that, but I, I, we used to jerk and say it was. 939 was a really terrible platform, but at least when it came, it might have got better later on. But it was, I was an early adopter and it was fucking awful. It was, it was kind of like the, the fucking uh, the, the P5 socket for in, in that regard. And, and that seems it's not as bad as people made out sometimes. I still wouldn't recommend it for newcomers. And, and is it kind of expensive to get into socket for? I, I wouldn't do it again at this point because I, I think by now it's probably well out of my range. But yeah... Uh, it's it's not a platform people go on there very much, and for good reason. If you, if you just want to get shit done, then obviously things like we've had a look at today are just going to be no use to you. you know, if you just like, I want to play some fucking Duke Nukem 3D, I want to play some Doom for God knows what reason, uh, I'm all doomed out as of now, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this thing's completely pointless, uh, but... It's interesting to, to look at these things that aren't all that well documented, and now it's documented, here at least, and I'm sure some other people have messed with it, but I like to test things for myself, because you never know unless you test it for yourself, and the more people who test these things, I guess the better conclusion you'll get. Somebody else may have something I've missed, but I don't know about that. Uh, you know, it's, it evades me if they have, at the moment. Anyways, uh, I think that's it. I don't really have anything else left to say on this matter. As I've said, we, we've tested it, we understand it. I wanted to do a video on the Yamaha 719, but I just wasn't feeling it. I'll come back to that another time. Things have gotten in the way of this because I had pieces I had to order. And, uh, for that, I, there's some shit I'll end up needing, probably. We'll see what happens. Uh, otherwise, I'm pretty much done. Uh, 
uh, for today out. So, as usual, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw up, load DOS 16 to it. One thing we do have to bear in mind this whole time is Intel does actually have a history of releasing some really weird CPUs. Uh, the DX2 Overdrive, I now have one of these, I've never owned one before, and it, it came with something, I didn't want it, and it's actually broken as it turns out. It, it worked once and never again, but yeah, these are absolutely pointless, like if, if you're into CPUs, don't bother with these if you've got a regular DX2, because they're actually no different. Like, when you think about it, the DX2 is a 5 volt CPU, it'll plug into regular 486 DX and SX boards, and it'll just work. There might be some really stubborn Micronics board or something that'll piss and moan about it, but I've never heard of one. Because I, I don't think the board can tell the difference unless it's designed to be able to, i.e. is made to take DX2 processors anywhere. The really early ones, it might just show up as a 486 DX, but it's still going to run at the, the increased speed, regardless of what the BIOS says. So yeah, the overdrive's kind of pointless. The reason this is, is this was the retail version and the, the regular DX2 was for OEMs and shit. But yeah, it, it's kind of silly looking back. Like, why make a different version of it with this heatsink on? It's just a bit weird. I mean, they did it with uh, Pentiums as well. You actually have Socket 5 overdrives, which doesn't really make any sense, as far as I can tell, because socket 5 chips will work in socket 5 boards anyway. The, the MMX overdrive, I can understand that sort of makes some sense, but yeah, I, uh, Intel does weird shit. I mean, Intel made like the Pentium 2 overdrive for Pentium Pro. I don't know, that one actually makes sense, because it, it, it makes the system not suck as bad, because it doesn't have a Pentium Pro in it. I, I don't like Pentium Pros. I, I never really got on with that thing at all. Uh, which is odd, because the Pentium 2 is basically the same architecture, and I found that to be brilliant. So, go figure. You know, obviously, they had, like, weird Pentium 4 extremes that nobody really bought, because they were prohibitively costly. Of course, things like that lay on are what I call wank chips. You know, like the Core i9. I don't think it was ever meant to sell well. It's not really designed to sell at all. It's just a wank chip. It's, it's there, so they get in the magazines, like, hey, look what we can do. We've built these things. It's fucking awesome, and that's its sole purpose for existing. Every company does it, so yeah, it, it, they don't seem to do it quite as much anymore. They're, they're weird and wacky things, but they have made like a few oddball things in the past for reasons unknown. At least a socket file overdrive seems to serve a purpose, I guess. It's not like that stupid DX2 overdrive. What a fucking waste of time that thing is. It's absolutely ridiculous.